We need to call the order. Our first order is the uh, um, attendance. Mr. Feldman. Here. Mrs. Ocasio. Here. Mrs. Jason. Here. Mr. Morrow. Here. Mrs. Bataglia. Here. Yeah, I'm having a brain left tonight. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Dave. And here. I am here. Can I have a motion to approve the roll? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion is carried. Um, can I get a motion to move to executive session for Thank you. I left it inside. Yeah, it matters are related to employment history of two particular individuals. So Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries. We will be returned for general session. out the technical difficulties I want to uh, bring us back to order here um, for those of you who are in the audience we called the order of the meeting to order at 630 we did the pledge and roll call and then we adjourned to executive session we are returning to general session at this point and we are up to the approval of the agenda on the item on the agenda um, can I have a motion to approve the agenda so moved. Second. And a second by Marianne uh, any discussion on the agenda items all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries unanimously. Next item on the agenda is minutes of the previous meeting. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. A motion and a second. Is there any discussion or corrections? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries unanimously also. Um, next one up is a communications message. Um, a couple things. 
We have the email, which I, I just added. If you didn't see it, I just I sent it to Sherry today. I haven't posted. I'm sorry. I should have sent it earlier. But it is on our board website now. It was the one I discussed at last week's meeting from Mrs. Pinkowski about service dogs. And it gives you some of her thoughts and, and policy that Williamsville has posted. <coughs> I'm actually going to forge a couple more emails that just have links to some other sites, some more information about it. Um, I also got a, uh, was in a conversation with the district resident that uh, after getting the year of schools was a little concerned about the diversity of our hiring because it didn't look very diverse and I uh, forwarded that information on to Mr. Day and I don't know if you've got any thoughts you want to add. Well, I think that you know, we are absolutely, it's a goal of ours is to diversify our staff. Uh, and we know how important it is when the kids see you, teachers that look like they do. So, but the, you know, there's restrictions on what we can actually do and advertise, but it is something that we are trying to very hard to, uh, to get more people of color to apply for our positions. Um, if they don't apply, we can't hire them. So it's something that we are actively working on, and we're actually going to be trying to step up our efforts and working with local colleges and universities to try and uh, make an effort to recruit, um, have more uh, people from their programs to try to apply for our positions and partnerships. So we definitely, I certainly uh, empathize and we recognize uh, the issue, uh, but it's something that we're actively trying to uh, take on. Some areas it's uh, more successful and it's easier than others. I think, though, I mean, it's worthy to point out at this point as well that the pool is is shallow. Yeah. I mean, there is not enough candidates. There's nobody going into education, and I mean, there's you know, on board. I think just did a uh, an article on that we will have a true teaching crisis. We were just discussing this. Um, today about, you know, there used to be incentives to get people to retire, and now, you know, the thought process is, will there be incentives to get people to stay because there's no candidates to take those positions. So it's it's difficult. I mean, I know in West Seneca, I can tell you that at, this, at, the, current, at the current time right now, we have two intern positions because we coach people to come fill them until we can find somebody to replace. But all positions are just a shallow pool out there. Thanks, Mr. Tech. Anyone else have any other communications they want to bring forward? Okay, that brings us up to open session. <coughs> As per Board Policy 1512, we hold two open sessions at each meeting. The first session is limited to comments on agenda <coughs> items for tonight's meeting. The Board walks, welcomes attendance and participation by district residents, persons having business within the boundaries of the school district, and persons doing business with the Board of Education. Speakers must be at least 16 years of age and will be limited to three minutes. Please preface your comments with your name, address, and group affiliation if appropriate. Anyone have anything they want to say? Once, twice, okay. That brings us on to unfinished business, and we have none. So with that, we'll move to the superintendent's report. Mr. Thanks, Mr. Johnson. So tonight, um, our uh, administrative team from the elementary and uh, middle school are here to help Mr. Wolf kind of help the board understand uh, results of the elementary and middle school assessments, the state assessments, and you know, I preface this conversation with, uh, we believe that these the tests are not the be all end all, but they're indicators, and they help guide what we're trying to do, but we don't put, there's many other pieces of information that we look at to make decisions about kids and about program, but they are good audits of where we stand in relation to the standard, and they give us a sense of where we're headed. So, uh, Mr. Wolf, we, we've tried to minimize the amount of numbers it can get overwhelming and try to share patterns and trends and also some of the things we're trying to do that kind of even nudge those trajectories a little bit more. Mr. Wolf? Yeah, so well, um, so like last week, we'll just take a look at some data tonight. I almost want this to rather be a direct presentation and I think it kind of lends itself to that. It can become a discussion about certain things. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at the data. I'm certainly not gonna go through step-by-step, slide-by-slide, talking about the numbers. Um, but just a couple of things to just to kind of remind the board about it, just to update everybody. Um, this is the second year for the three through eight testing that we have now been into like a new set of testing. Okay, so we actually can compare the results from this past year's 2019 to 2018 because the tests were similar. They were given over two days, kids had extended time, and they, were used, they used the same scaling because they kind of did a new baseline and they reestablished the standard two years ago. Now. 
keep this in mind that we have one more year that we'll be giving the same assessment, but two years from now, in 2020, they're actually gonna re-baseline the test again because the assessments are now going to follow the next generation standards. These, these tests for three through eight, math and ELA, follow the common core standards. But New York State adopted the next gen, where we're gradually, they've learned their lesson from the last time, they're gradually bringing in the next gen standards. So you're gonna continue to see changes <coughs> as this, but with, with the sorts we look, at least we're kind of comparing like apples to apples, maybe different varieties Just of Just a couple more notes before, I'm sorry. This is one of the reasons why we're not gonna spend, you know, we don't, we're not gonna <coughs> anchor ourselves. It's much more important to talk about trends <coughs> and things that we can look at to improve as opposed to the actual numbers themselves. I also want to do a mea culpa. Mr. Wolf pointed out to me today that when I was kind of tweaking the PowerPoint on Friday, I had duplicated the, some slides. They were the exact same slides. We had to correct the math and the slides for uh, the elementary and middle. So those you didn't see over the weekend. And you might have thought, wow, that's pretty consistent performance uh, in the LA and math. So I, take, I, I apologize for that. Go ahead, Mr. Wolf. Yeah. Um, the other thing, just to update you on the testing system, is this will be the last year that we give the fourth grade science test, 2020. Next year, there's not going to be a fourth grade test at all. They're going to skip a year, and then the following year, they're going to give a fifth grade science test. So again, that's changing too. So a lot of things are changing. So just to kind of keep you updated how some of things are going. Um, we did put a slide in about test refusal. I kind of this, this kind of echoes what Mr. Day was talking about, is that while we want to use these assessments to get good information, and I think when we look at the results, especially against other kids that took a similar test you know, across the area, it kind of helps us to know the areas within our curriculum that we may want to take a closer look at and each of the kind of tests. So that's really helpful. But we do, as you can see by the refusal rates, we still do have a number of kids that are refusing to take the tests. And it certainly goes up as they start in grade three and by the time we get to eighth grade, so to the point where we actually almost have about 20% of our kids that are not actually taking these tests. So we have to keep that in mind as we look at percentages. And like Mr. Day said, we don't want to use this as, as the end all be all measure. There are multiple measures we use and certainly my colleagues behind me as they talk about things that they're looking at, they can talk about that tonight. But we just kind of give you a little bit of a breakdown of what that kind of looks like and um, you know, the, the different levels of kids that, that may be refusing. But it's still, we still have a number of kids that are refusing to take the test. Um, just real quickly, you're gonna kind of see the, like a, a general slide of grades three through five at the elementary level and then at the middle level, six through eight, you want to see the breakdown of some of the things that are happening here. This is, this is just about, about ELA. Um, not a lot of great changes, but if you look like through the years, and again, you have to look at it with a fine, like take this as a grain of salt. This is actually the largest percentage that we've had for this range of kids, for elementary kids, three through five, that have actually met proficiency in the five or six years that we've really been looking at the new assessments. So it has been getting better each and every year. And it's like that. It was the same also for the middle school. Okay, so we have more kids actually, but this range of kids in grades three through five, like meeting the standard. But you can kind of look, we've had like a little, a few less kids at level one, which that's critical. Like we want to get as many kids out of level one as possible, because as we really have looked at the long range goal of kids, kids that get into the level two range and level three, their outcome at the high school level is very, very positive right now unless the standard changes at the high school level. But we definitely see some improvements, uh, improvements at level one. But the slides that you're looking at on the left-hand side, at Sweet Home, the last two years, again, tests that are similar now of nature, we can kind of compare them. And then on the right, the New York State results. And you know, the, I, I, the tests aren't the end all be all. I think all of us have said that before, but the, the small things that you're pointing out, I think are important to kind of celebrate because you know, our kids are working hard. I think that getting less kids at level one is critical, absolutely critical. Uh, and then seeing more and more kids on the proficient end. The other thing, and it's, it's up here for a reason, I think we talked about it last week. We really, um, we wanted to celebrate our graduation rate where we talked about advanced distinction. We really want to still focus on that area of proficiency. Because we know that those kids that are at the proficient level have the greatest likelihood of the outcome that they'll be an advanced distinction kind of a kid. We want to push that level. Um, and right now you're looking at 44, you know, it's not too far off if you think about it, what our advanced distinction levels are like right now at high school. Remember, we, have, we celebrated the 55%, but we've been in that 40 range to 50. So um, 
There may be a correlation, there may, may not be, but it, it looks like there's a similarity there. Uh, the same thing you'll see at the middle school. Again, um, we've had some, we had some pretty strong performance at, eighth, at the, eighth, the eighth grade group that left and is in the high school right now. But again, a lot of similarities over last year. Not anything really drastic, but definitely a, a stronger group in eighth grade in the, in the scores that they gave on ELA and stuff like that. Um, we did provide you with the subgroup, and we've talked about this every year. And we still see the same gaps that we've been seeing. And it's not, we don't ignore these gaps, we're trying to work on them. But I think in working on one group, we're really trying to lift all groups up. Um, and I think it's ha it has had an effect. And unless you suddenly look at, it's like, it's like you said, Mr. Jason, unless you suddenly look at over time, like it has gotten better. You know, so it, it'll be interesting to see as things kind of progress and they even change the assessments a little bit, but again. But um, I'm gonna like just pause here just stop here. This is the overall breakdown of ELA. Now you can kind of see what it looks like between buildings. And I'm gonna like just like it open up to my colleagues if there's anything that they want to talk about in terms of like how they want how they're kind of addressing some of the needs looking at ELA assessment, but then again looking at many other things along the way. Because honestly they've been doing a lot of work, I would say over the last ten months, just a lot of work to really create very strong data teams to really look at this kind of information with their um, their schools. So. Anybody want to like chime in? Well, I think in every elementary building, we, we've all done it maybe a little, a little bit differently, but um, I think the same concepts are, are there. We're all trying to really uh, form a really strong response to intervention block where we're getting uh, <coughs> uh, uh, as many uh, staff members together, if it's a third grade team or second grade team or first grade team, getting the teachers together with the interventionists and other resources like using program aids and things like that to uh, look at look at the added information kid by kid, uh, target specific skills, um, and use you know, research-based uh, programming or, or, even, or even just uh, strategies to help uh, improve the learning outcomes for those kids, uh, for all kids in, in, in the grade level. Um, I, I, said, I think that we also have done a, um, a really good job uh, really trying to focus on, on building these teams uh, that, that look at data uh, consistently and try to do that regularly. Um, I know across the district, our, one of our focuses is going to be around, you know, it's been around developing professional learning communities. And um, I just know even at Willow Ridge, I have teams of teachers that are, are meeting more frequently and regularly already before we even roll this out, but going back into the summertime, looking at data, um, identifying specific areas and target areas where we need to focus our, our efforts. Um, we One of the trends, I know, know that we noticed at Willow Ridge, especially on the math side, was around fractions, and so we have teams of teachers really focusing on fractions and, and, look, and, and looking at the curriculum that we currently have and how we need to supplement it to help support our kids learning you know, in that area. So, um, turn over to <coughs> I would say to, to add to what Bob's saying, to give more of a like, specific um, visual uh, of what we're doing um, across the district, the elementary, is our RTI, we created RTI blocks, so half an hour each day at each grade level. And it's a very um, all hands on deck concept. So in addition to the grade level teachers, so there might be three or four grade level teachers, um, we also have an interventionist, a coach, and a program aide that, um, are working to, uh, in small group instruction for any kids that have been identified in need for that particular uh, time period. So <clears throat> they meet during collaboration. Last year our collaboration went extremely well. Um, it was time well spent every single uh, day, one day uh, per week for each grade level, we meet the coaches and administrator to identify kids um, based on our interim assessments and our, our formative assessments that needed um, special attention. We met, take seven, um, you know, it, teachers and interventionists and create small groups of kids. It's very flexible. Um, it's based on really like uh, very, um, you know, authentic assessments that the teachers are, are giving. Um, and so it, it worked out really great this year. So we're very excited about next year. Actually, the collaboration <coughs> time that we've created through the new um, schedule, master schedule, um, I think actually is working even better than it worked last year, giving the teachers from uh, 7.50 to 8.30 that time, because now they can um, meet not only with the instructional coaches, um, but they also have um, the opportunity to meet with all the interventionists as well and special ed teachers. So everybody's free during that time to meet. So it's a very powerful time in the, in the morning, um, teachers getting together and planning for the day and making, um, you know, creating those small groups. Um, so it's been actually this year's already. I think we're off to a really great start. I think the other thing I would add is that yeah, the new structure is really supports supports this model really really well. 
guess I have a quick question. Um, are you still looking, I mean, is there, I don't know if maybe Mr. Wolf is doing this, but if you look at this data that we're looking at, if you notice Maple Mirror level one, there's like 11%. Is anybody saying, you know, what are they doing that maybe we can incorporate or, or what's different? And then, you know, if you look at your proficiency level, they're up to 52. Are, is there groups looking at that saying, you know, what are they maybe doing that we can incorporate in some of the other schools? Or? Well, the, I think the advantage of the elementary level, honestly, is that we have groups of coaches that work very, very closely together. So they're always trying so to identify those, those things. So they're like, they can be a really strong conduit to kind of spread the best practice. Plus, quite honestly, there's a lot of, there's, there is so much more consistency happening at the elementary program than there ever has been through the years. So I, I think that it helps to do that. I, I guess this is the, the only thing that I would, you know, just, a, the warning is, you can't hang your hat on just one year's worth of data. Um, but I think at any time, you know, kids are finding success, right, you, you know, you celebrate it. Right. And then you ask, like, well, why did, what was maybe different? And I, I think we're trying to do that. And, it, you know, it just kind of brings me, like, because I know I had a conversation um, with Mrs. Dimitrov today about, like, some of the kids, like, where the kids are, like, coming in, like, from where they were the year before, and how it's, like, so much more positive. I know you mentioned about your kindergartners, but I've heard it, like, some of our first grades, and some of the things that they're doing, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the changes there, but you're not wrong. I mean, those, those conversations are constantly happening. Yeah, they're happening. Yeah. Do we have coaches? Um, this is kind of, where are our coaches again? Can you just elementary. Math coach and an literacy coach in each building at the elementary school. So they are still at each building. Yeah, well, you talked about by saying that we, we celebrate, um, I guess, small wins. So what we look at um, at the middle school, we look at a cohort. So for example, um, fifth grade went from a 29% and then sixth grade to a 53%. So we celebrated that moment. Um, in sixth grade, where it shows a 35%, we did go down from 43% for that cohort year. When they were in sixth grade going to seventh, they went down to 35%, which was an 8% decrease for us. We talked about that. And then lastly, um, seventh grade, that went to eighth grade, they were 40% and then they went to 59%. Um, so we talked about the increase. Um, we talked about that there's different dynamics. In fifth grade, the test could be harder than the sixth grade. And it's been noted that has been said by several teachers and we kind of concur or we do agree. Um, so we said, what do we do in this kind of situation to help our students? And so what we did, we created the, the epic period, the enrichment period and content. And for us, it's only 37 minutes, so it's not going to be the cure-all for everything for us. But what it does, it allows students who need some uh, special assistance in um, English and in math that are not getting credit <coughs> services or are not getting resource, it allows them to get caught up or it allows them to try as best as we can to get them at, at baseline um, level or to raise them up as high as we possibly can go. Um, in science, it's the opposite because they have biology in eighth grade, so they take that as a lab but on those opposite days, they pushed them a little further. And then we have an innovation period. Um, we started off with 44 students, but the innovation period is, is strictly based on the student wanting to, to really do it by themselves and be self-motivated. So right now we have, I believe, 16 students that are in that program that can be pushed above and beyond. And it's the beginning steps. So as we said before, we're, we're looking just to make some small gains. If we make a big one, it's, it's fantastic. But what I tell them, let's drive for excellence and we'll just do it one step at a time just to see where we can get and go from here. So. Mr. Baker, do not sell yourself short with just that simple 37 minutes. And I don't even know, what, I, how many years? Four years that I've been sitting here asking about AIS at the middle school. This is the first concrete idea that's really risen from the middle school. So 37 minutes is a lot of time to be able to do some good. So. For you to be able to find that in that schedule, kudos to you and your team because you know that you know that that middle school schedule is not easy. So, I would offer in literacy, in EOA especially in literacy, we, we we spent a lot of time, a lot of work the last five six years on our core curriculum and the manner in which we deliver that. And there's still work to be done there. We really want to make make sure that we're intervening because we the one we are getting a number of kids that come to our elementary schools and they in third grade and fourth grade and that's a different program and they oftentimes need supports to try and get them on the standard. The other is because we believe that, uh, as the next slide will test, we, some of the work has to do with we've got to get kids to, uh, we have to get them more secure and more solid in literacy as they leave primary. And then the, because those, 
If we make a dent in that, we believe these level one numbers will drop systemically from elementary into middle level. So I'd ask Mr. Wolf to kind of talk a little bit about the next, these graphs here, which we think this is a real lever uh, for us going forward. Right, and we've, we've talked a little bit about this. Like when we really studied the program, and like Mr. Jay said, we looked at the core, and we realized there's a, there's a part of the core that we really need to be beefed up, and that was the whole word study vocabulary part. And um, so last year we really started to do a lot of work in this area. And uh, we did bring in a consultant that's kind of helping us kind of navigate this. When we said we were going to go into an area, we said, let's bring somebody in that really knows this stuff really well. And like she has honestly really challenged us. And what you see up here on these slides are the foundational grade levels, K1 and 2. And it's not just looking at their, just their reading level, which would be based on like a, a Fontas Vanel benchmark assessment. It's looking at that alongside a spelling inventory. And you might say, well, why are we using a spelling inventory? Because I think you have to understand, like, what came first, reading or writing? Well, writing really came first. So what our kids really have to do, they have to be able to read, but they also really have to know how to write. And they have to understand the written code. Because that's what reading is. It's a written code. And so we're really diving deep. We're looking at text. We're trying to understand what authors are putting in the kind of text at those level and what, what the, the level of written code is in those books and making sure that we're exposing and teaching kids the word study that are at those levels. And so what you see here are the percentage of kids that actually are meeting the end of the year benchmark on the F&P. For example, in kindergarten, they had to get to a level D, okay? Doesn't mean anything, but the level D, we have criteria for that. And then we want to, and we know that this is a long-term goal, but we want them to get to mastering the blends part of this spelling inventory. Okay, and getting, getting all the feature points for being able to spell words that have blends. Because if they can spell them and they can write them, they can read them too. Because it, it really kind of goes together. So it's a really strong relationship with reading and writing. But as you can see right now, we only have about 23% of our kindergartners are there. And over the next couple of years, that number is going to grow. And as that grows, it's going to impact the first grade numbers. And as that grows, it's going to impact the second grade numbers. Because right now, as you can see, we want kids at the end of second grade to be a level M, for whatever the level M is about, okay? And then we want them to be able to do um, syllable junctures, like read words with syllables. Because we know when kids get to third grade, it's really multi-syllabic words that get in their way. They have reading in them and writing them. And right now, we have about 43% of our kids that are at that standard. So this is going to grow, and it's going to be pushed ahead. And we're trying to find tools and techniques to do that at the foundational level that's really going to support our workshop model. And I honestly have to say, there are some really special things. And I, I would invite you, when you have a chance to do your tours of the schools, when you visit the elementary schools, that you stop in to like kindergarten or first grade class. These guys, I'm sure, are going to take a little tour, see what kinds of stuff are happening now that's helping to push this integrated word study model all the way up. And then, of course, in the upper grades, a high focus on language and vocabulary. And it shows up on all these tests. When we look at tests, we can tell that kids struggle with vocabulary. And unfortunately, a lot of the kids that are coming into our schools are very diverse. They have language and vocabulary issues. And we have to start to address them because we've seen those numbers go up too. So it's no coincidence that some of these, these percentages are the way they are. But that's kind of another measure that we're really going to try to focus in on. Um, the gal that, and I talked to Mr. Day about this, and this is something you can talk about, but Beth Swenson, we've talked to that and used that name. She's going to be here in October, and I think he's going to ask you if you wanted, if you ever wanted to have any time to talk with her or ask her questions about this stuff, she'd be available to you um, at one of your meetings, if you at the meeting in October, but you can think about that. Is there any really questions about this? Do you guys want to talk about what you're noticing in your buildings as far as some of this foundational work that was done last year? Um, well, I would say Beth um, worked um, with um, Jess Wilkinson um, as a laboratory classroom. Um, so she spent a tremendous amount of time collaborating with her um, via Skype with Lee Hildreth, our instructional coach. And basically what it really was is our teachers are at a point right now with the workshop model that they're highly skilled at executing the workshop model. What Beth has changed our thinking in is that we're now integrating so it's not separate reading and writing workshops. It's melded together in a very meaningful way, which really um, helps our kids in terms of um, improving their writing through reading and improving their reading through 
through writing. <laughs> so um, we've seen uh, it's a very it's been extremely contagious at Glendale. So um, after uh, her work with the kindergarten level, um, our first grade teachers came to me and said, "Can we have some time to go into Jess's room and see the morning message?" And it's based around this morning message. It really is the morning message is taken from a teaching point from. Um, the learning from the day before. So um, it's it's very fluid and um, it's very meaningful to, and authentic to what's going on in the classroom. Um, and it's based around content too, so it's kind of like an inquiry, inquiry type model. So um, our last unit was around um, chicks. So we, each of the kindergarten classrooms <clears throat> had an incubator with chicks with eggs. And, and um, typically speaking, I guess the big takeaway from me was that it's really all about expectations. So historically speaking, um, we were like thrilled when kids could write two sentences at the end of kindergarten. At the end of our unit on, with, the, our, with the chicks, they were, the students in kindergarten were writing a full book. So with illustrations and two to three sentences on a page. And it was all about, they were very inspired about the content. Um, they labeled everything in their classroom that had to do with the, the incubator and the chicks and the environment. Um, they could tell you much, but like they were telling me things I didn't know about, about the development of the chicken. Um, so it was really, um, it was really exciting to watch and it inspired the first grade teachers to say, hey, can we take a look at this? So now our work um, moving on, moving forward this year, Beth is going to be working with the first grade teachers. So it's really a progressive look at really raising the expectations. Um, and it was very exciting to watch and unfold. And I can't wait to see what's going to happen this year. I do want to point out, we've, made, we've invited teams to, produce, to work with Beth, but we've not had them. So there's some teams that are interested. And there's, a, there's one team that wants to do kind of their own professional learning community study in a building. And we're good with that, because we think that's what they want to do. What we're really looking for is we're asking them to make games and try to find new ways to move along. But if they think it, this, they want to try and do it themselves, we're willing to let them do that as opposed to making everybody do the same thing. So that was our opt-out discussion. I'll never forget. Trust me. I got you to say that. Knocked out. <laughs> so <coughs> did, are, are all schools doing, are each of the elementary schools, are they all following this method? They're all working. Some of them are working off of that model, and others are working off trying to develop a different model. Um, but you know, the idea, the concept of it's integrated, meaning you know, you, writing is connected to reading and reading is connected to writing. That's universal, and, and there would just be different ways to approach study. And I guess I would just say that, again, I applaud you for allowing it to go that way because I think that you know, pedagogy is just like that's what's key is what I've been sitting here trying to say. Like when we're looking at the consultants who are coming in, it doesn't necessarily necessarily match the teachers, it, it, you know, allowing them that flexibility and freedom to, develop, to, to be able to develop um, what they feel is right is, I think, so huge because they know their kids better than... It's just, they, they, have to, they have to understand the goal centrally is getting kids further along in the learning. They choose to go in a different direction to get to that point. I'm okay with it. And they also have to get through, they have to look at results and make decisions and corrections if it doesn't and, and ultimately, you're still holding them to the same standard, so it doesn't make a difference how we get, I guess, it doesn't make a difference how we get there, it's are we getting there, and if one method, whatever methods work, and I guess that's what I've been trying to say as I've been preaching about professional development. We have really great people in our district, and if we can continuously say we hire the best, we should be allowing them to do their work and not necessarily always forcing them to, to, to do the work of what somebody who is obviously renowned is bringing in, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way. I do have a question about the assessment, so, which is also always my question. So how often are teachers being pulled out? Like, So like, I know they're in trimesters, right? They're the elementary. Yes. So it, in the trimester period, how often are teachers um, outside of the classroom doing assessment? I'm not asking about, you know, assessment that they're doing within, you know, when they're actually physically there. How often do they have to be outside their classroom to assess kids? One day each trimester. One, one day each trimester. Yeah. 
And so then that's it. That's the only time they're pulled from their students. Any other questions about this? Um, a few years ago, when we started the word study, I was corrected, so we're not spelling anymore in the word study. Where are we? Are we back to primary spelling? Are we back? That's really what this this is all about. That's what this is. Okay, so we're we're not doing this. Are we doing spelling tests? Are we doing that kind? Of? Like we don't have a traditional spelling program. Okay. You're not going to have ten words a week. Everybody right. memorize the same words. Okay. It's really based on learning and understanding of how words work. There's a progression the kids go through, and it's knowing where the kids are and meeting the needs of the kids where they are, teaching what is spelling through writing as opposed to memorizing uh, lists of words. Well, they also work when they're writing in their notebooks or stories or pages, whatever, um, they, there was often words that weren't spelled right. And I questioned, you know, do you, what do we do with those words? Are you going to correct them? Are you not? Are you? And there was, they, well, no, we let them go. So is that still the theory where we can change it? Yeah. Okay, so I mean, they're still in Venice spelling, I and mean, you can't like keep a kid from writing because right. they have to spell it right. correctly. But I think what we're what we're doing now is we're being really, almost with, like a laser-like focus, explicitly teaching the the kind of word study that kids need as they progress through the levels of their reading, because it really does kind of show you what kind of writing they should be doing. So it really is a very explicit thing, and so a lot of the words that they're writing are also the words that they're reading. But there's other tools, there's tools and things. And a lot of the, the same tool folders, the same, a lot of this, they're all happening in all the four buildings. There might be a little different approaches to integrating it, but. I would think that, like in a kindergarten, if they tried to spell a two syllable word, yeah. now that's not, that's like yeah. second grade, so a word that's gonna be inventive spelling, do your best. But if they're trying to spell the word duck and use the word the CK, the digraph CK, they don't use that correctly. That would be a place where you can correct the teachers. Be that would be in the zone of where they are trying to learn. I'm just trying to get an understanding of what what kind of is corrected and what you wait right. for, for future. My last question is, um, we always talk about getting these kids early. Are our pre-K kids, is there any discussion with our pre-K teachers to kind of get these kids really off to a great start? Our pre-Kers, they're more and more on board with what we're doing like every, every single year. And uh, I would say this year they're going to take a really huge step in that direction. They've actually had a chance to do some of the same work um, or meet with some of the same people that, that our K-1 okay. teachers so work with. Professional development is yeah. available for them. Yeah, that's we were rewritten the pre-K curriculum based yeah. on the pre-kindergarten so. When we talk about like at each, like the kids need to be at a specific reading level, how aware are the kids? that they have to be at a level. Are these kids aware? Like, do they know where they need to be? How aware do we make kids? I think we try not to make them overly aware of that. Um, I think and actually some, a lot of times we get parents that are very focused on that. They want to know the reading level and, and understand it. So they want to get a, uh, a reference point for how their child's doing. Um, more and more we're talking about, rather than just isolated singular, le singular levels, we're talking more about bands. So kids aren't like you know Emory years anymore. You know they were they're, they're reading you know uh, various books. And it depends on their um, you know obviously if a kid who's very interested in a topic is gonna their reading level on that topic is gonna be a lot higher than if they're not interested. Just the same thing with us. If we're reading something technical, like it's we're very slow and it's labored. But as adults, it isn't something we're interested in. You know we, we move along more quickly. So we're trying we're we're trying to. Uh, I think that was never the intention for kids to be focused on levels, and we're, just, we're trying to get away from that by doing different things in terms of labeling baskets differently and, um, and, 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 and diversifying their what, what they're picking from their choices and texts. So. If anything, I think we're moving in an opposite direction, yeah. trying to cultivate the joy of reading. Okay. It's interesting that you should bring that up, Mr. Smarl, because at Open House this year, as I was moving through my daughter's schedule, uh, um, that was actually brought up that her English teacher was saying she continuously hears when she talks about free read, like when we're talking about free read with kids, that kids will say to her, I used to be a reader, but my joy of reading was killed when I had to write those post-it notes. And I will tell you, 18 years in this district, and I can 100% attest to the fact that that killed both of my kids. I mean, Christy and I actually saw Read this summer, um, because I just bought her books and she didn't have to put a post-it note on it. Uh, and you know, so it worked out. But like for the most part, 
that it's interesting that you say to go back to the joy of reading. Because that's where I'm, I think when you talk, Mr. Day, about bringing up these kids at a young age, that's what we need to see. We need to see these kids, the emphasis, of course, on reading be placed at home, which is an age-old question. How do we get all the people to come and be on board with all of us? And then the, you know, the second part of that is what do we do? Like, how do we get kids to love to read? So I'm glad to hear the joy of reading come from you. That's excellent. But I think it's just it's important to note that if you can't read the words on the page, you'll never have any joy. Right. That's why it's so important. You have to be able to break the code. And you learn the code by trying to communicate through the code. That's why really we're going to have much more emphasis on teaching writing with kids early. So they learn what the code is, so therefore they can recognize it when they see others. But if you never break the code, you'll never have any joy. So and that's what's really important. Are we going to have, like, because you know the message to parents for years and years has been when they caught, like, you have to start reading with your kids and point to the words and, like, all the, like, I am by no means an elementary teacher whatsoever, so forgive me for you know, <laughs> not using good terminology. But are we now going to be, is the message that parents will get is our kids should be writing? Where they come to kindergarten. I mean, there's always this emphasis that when kids come to kindergarten, I mean, we are a nation of competitive people. And, you know, we have watched this within education. Our kids have to be the best. Our kids have to have the best resume when they go to college. Whatever it is, in our nation, we explode that. And it means, you know, we go 100 times more than what was ever expected. So my question is, is like, what is the message parents will receive? Is it that now we, we are starting writing with kids? Or, I mean, I'm not trained to do that. Thank God I'm done with that, but. No, the answer is no. Okay, so it is just the same old stuff, but when they, when you get them in the elementary schools, you, that's where you buy, that's where you're focused. You know what my message to parents today in the 21st century is that you've got to talk with your kids. You have to engage them in conversation. You need to get them to put their devices off to the side and look at you and talk. And you got to get them outside. You have to experience the world. And you got to give them vocabulary. And the that's what you need to get. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Not. You, and you need to read with your kids. You don't have to point out words. You just have to read and, and show a love of print. I mean, all the same things we've always asked for. But I'm going to tell you, right in this day and age, people are so fixed on devices at such early ages that it is creating a language problem when kids come to the kindergarten that we've never had before. It is, it is, it's a dilemma, but it's, we want them to do what we've always wanted. And, so, I, and I will honestly say to you, like, I, I call them my mother of the year moments. They're not really mother of the year moments. When I've done, I've completely failed as a parent, and I've had plenty in my day. But one of my more proud moments is when I found either of the girls when they were super young before school like at the bookshelf with books. And I was like, hey, I think I did something right here. So I love your message. That's wonderful. So thank you. So I think just to kind of close out the literacy piece, we'll have an opportunity to kind of have Mrs. Swenson come and talk with you a little bit. And it's very, like she's one of the smartest people I've ever met, but she'll have to try and compartmentalize it so to speak. You understand the gist of what we're trying to talk about. So we'll, we'll work on that throughout this year. Or, as okay, or, at least, or, or at least tell us, like, what are you really, what are your questions? And then we'll keep her conversation brief. Because okay. she has a tendency to talk a lot. <laughs> you think I'm mad? I have a simple question about that. What's BAS? Oh, that, that Benchmark last year. Assessment. Benchmark Assessment System? Oh, yeah, yeah. oh I didn't know it was in the title. Yeah, it says it's, I was looking, <laughs> it's focused on the data. Sorry, I'm I was sorry. there in the title. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Feldman, that is, it's a reading assessment that, uh, that great gauges what kind of text kids can um, handle independently or with a little bit of support? No, I got that. I thought that it was related to blends and that type of thing. Yeah. I got you. So wait, is that administered electronically or is that the, what the teacher pulls out each semester? Yes, or you, have to sit, you have to sit and listen to the student and then ask follow-up questions and gauge from the follow-up questions understanding and comprehension. So this is based on the one-day yes. each the semester? Part, that's the well, they, that's really what it's used for. Sit individually with the student. Probably takes 20 to 30 minutes per student. So they don't do all. The, they don't get all the kids done in a day. They get the bulk, and then they finish them up. Right. Older for more. Younger kids, books are short. And that's 
So if we're only, so then there's multiple days that teachers are actually out of the classroom because if we're not finishing all the kids in one day, then we have to be out multiple times. They're not out. They may do it. Back in, they'll do it in literacy block. They'll do it while kids are reading or a student over. Uh, and it's just because it's a smaller number. It doesn't make dictate another time. So let's just let's just kind of finish up with math here. Um, again, similar results um, that we've seen over the years. Um, really, kind of like what you see in New York State, comparable. Um, some highs and some lows, some variances from year to year, but not drastic. Um, certainly, a lot of areas that we still know we need to work on. I know that um, the, one of the areas that Mr. Polino talked about was fractions. It's very clear like starting in third grade. Some of our kids have an issue with fractions. And it's not just looking at our kids. I mean, kids across the area are having trouble with fractions. And this is why when you look at this test, you also have to look at the questions. You have to look at, like, we maybe have to show a gap between, like, say, MOCs, like kids similar to us, but they have gaps too. So it, fractions are an area against the Common Core or against the standards that are being measured here. Can I just but, ask you something on that? You know, when we, I think um, Scott and I have gone over to, I think it was Glendale, years ago, and we sat in one of the classrooms and we said, you know, what's the biggest challenge to our kids? And their answer was, with math, fractions. So this is nothing new. I mean, we know our kids are having trouble with fractions. So, yeah, exactly, I have trouble with fractions. So are we do, gonna do something, are we doing something different? Yes, we're trying to do okay. lots of things. The other thing when I talked to the coaches was, was we looked at the data, as soon as it came out, we could actually look at our results compared to everything else, it was, it was very evident the same thing comes to play. Our language needs of our kids are in fact impacting math, and you see that. It's, it's evident in the results. So that's another thing, because the math test is an independent reading test also. So that's another thing that we are constantly battling and trying to work on. So you talk about disciplinary literacy for math, that's something we have to continue to do more on and give our kids the, the stamina and ability to do these kinds of rich tasks and problems independently, which we continue to work on. Do you guys want anything else with math and learn to figure them out? Sure. Um, just on a, yeah. on a broader scope, um, you know, while I certainly understand that the results of the kids are a reflection of our effectiveness in the building, uh, I think sometimes the numbers lose stories. Um, and so for me, while you know, we're certainly proud of the growth that we made, I think you know, there's tons of examples of kids. Um, for example, late last spring, we received a phone call from a parent um, who had a fourth grader opt out as a third grader. Um, she called me and kind of expressed her disappointment and her ideas about why she wanted to opt out her child again. And, and um, she said, why can't? Because he's insistent that he's prepared and he wants to get off the test. And to me, that's a reflection of the learning experience and culture that our teachers have given. So, you know, while we've tried something a little bit differently in terms of a co op model, um, you know, we've had a whole entire fourth grade, you know, group of teachers wrap around this one kid who, you know, frankly has test anxiety and fear of failure. And now he wants to, he calls challenge New York State. So, frankly, it really didn't matter what he got on the New York State assessment, but he was willing to challenge um, take on because it's something that he has to learn and be prepared for, um, you know, for the future. He's going to take lots of state tests. So, you know, I'm just grateful to, to our staff. And I think it was Jason asked a good question about the level ones. And I think what I think we're most proud of as a team is that we can assure everyone on board that we take a look at every single one of our kids. So when we talk about data teams and kind of this generic term, we're talking about the group of professionals, what I would consider the best in West New York, no matter what our results say, I'll put up our teachers against anyone else. We can assure you that every single kid's accounted for, we're making goals for, and if they are not a goal standard, we are making moves in terms of instruction, whether it's during the intervention block or during the workshop, that we're meeting kids' needs. And so it's not from one to four, it's how do we keep the kids continuously growing, um, at least from one to two, or hopefully someday from two to four. Um, but that proficiency level is one in here, but I think what we're most proud of is we're in SST and intervention where every kid's looked at and we're giving our energy not only at the kids that are ones, but also kids that are fours. They're the kids that are threes that we want to grow to fours. Um, because too often those kids are missed over that. Oh, they're on grade level standards, so no, they, they can independently read. No, we have a responsibility to those kids and their families that they continue to grow as well. I think that's what we're most proud of, um, is that, you know, the data isn't perfect. Um, but I can say, you know, 12% growth of the year is tight. But we also know there's plenty of challenges ahead, but we have to keep that momentum going, keep learning experiences and culture where kids are excited teachers making goofy videos about the task and kids out of families because that's the message to families. It's not you need to read more with your family and you need to grab your kid and read tonight. It's my I the best day school, this is what I did, and then parents are excited about the work that we do. Let's let that resonate. <laughs>
Just real quick, sixth grade again, uh, the sixth grade permits are uh, higher than New York State, but there's something that's not on the site that you have to realize. So back in 2015, the same group of kids, from this, this grade, from six to eight, 30 percent of our kids were meeting standard. 2015, 2019, 40 percent. So 16% increase in like five years. Um, and this is, it's probably, it's an impact of a lot of things. Like some stuff foundationally is getting at the elementary level. It takes time, but it moves into the middle school. And so while we certainly have a lot of work to do, we will not say that we don't, okay? Um, but, you know, we're very proud of the fact there is progress. It's just a slow progress. But as you can see, compared to the rest of the states, there's a lot of similarities to you know, data in that data. Um, and also keep in mind, get into the middle school, there are more and more kids that choose not to take the assessment, okay? So it's not, you know, you have to take it. You can't take everything with a great salt, but it's good information. And again, the test will provide us a window into some of the things curricularly that we might want to look at. And But right now, as we're looking at like the middle school math people and we worked on it last year, like they're now taking a look at the new next generation standards and how that is going to change the way they teach in some place. They're moving some of the, the curriculum around between seventh and eighth grade. But uh, some of the areas, the assessment, there are areas in math that kids don't do as well as what a lot of people struggle, but they tend not to be those core areas that are often tested, they tend to be some of the secondary, like the additional and some of the supporting areas. And are not, they say that you're only supposed to spend like 15% of your time teaching as opposed to 75% of your time teaching. So those are some of the areas that we're definitely falling on, but we certainly have have more work to do. I don't have anything you want to say here about math. No, I echo what everybody says. Again, some performance match up kind of trend, right? We've seen the same trend um, over and over again. Uh, Close a little gap, so like male and female, so it's just kind of a little bit, a little bit closer here than an ELA. Um, and then you see the overall results, and you, and you just see that, you know, I know Mr. Uh, Brian was talking about the gains that he saw in school uh, from one year to next. Uh, you know, very, very proud of, of what's happening in all the elementary buildings, but certainly can recognize uh, the growth in Maple Mirror this past year. Um, so we were really pleased by that. And the same thing, I mean, you can look at the 63.7% for our eighth grade kids. That includes the kids that are also in our accelerator outreach program. Um, Highest it ever been, okay, you know. But I mean, there's again lots of work still to be done. Any any questions about any other questions about math or thoughts? Did grade state the three through eight exam? They take just the algebra test, and that's just been a result. You can see oh, so you're just if, you're just, if you take all the kids that take algebra away, it's at thirty-five percent proficiency. You see that for eighth grade. But when you add in all those kids that were in the accelerated, then it brings it up. Those kids they were levels over at mastery. A lot of them weren't mastering that. So that's how you put them up to proficient. But they're all proficient. But, but we, right. I guess we're making an assumption that they would have taken the three tests. They probably would have. Yeah. 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 So, 72 kids last year, 30 yield, one achieved 85 to higher. Which is pretty strong. Right. And just the thing that I like about it is just the sheer number of kids, the number of kids that we have actually had that are challenging that. It's higher than a lot of schools, quite honestly. Um, the kids are having that opportunity to be that. And still numbers continue to rise, both with living environment and with um, the introvert assessment. Um, just to kind of something, like just to kind of finish up, just to give you some information on science. Like I said, this will this year will be the last year. We have one more year of this administration. Um, we did a little bit of a gen science uh, this year, um, and believe me, Mrs. Aldridge took that very very seriously. You can just imagine, um, you know. But we're very very proud of our science program. There's there's a lot of reasons why things happen the way they do, and I'm not going to get into all the details. Yet. We can talk some more about that if you want to, but um, I don't anticipate that being this way this year. And actually, I was just in her classroom today, and there was some pretty cool stuff happening. But again, she, just so you know, she is gearing up for the kinds of assessments that our kids are going to have to take when they're in the next generation of assessments. So a lot of the work that she's doing is really pushing the envelope in their inquiry, their skill, understanding science and engineering practices, really getting them to do the cross concepts, concept, and they know the language. Like, they're creating the models now. So when our elementary kids get to middle school, they're going to be well prepared for the kinds of things that they're going to have to do. How will the guide connection standards, how else will the guide change? Yeah, I, th it's, I think it's going to be a very, very different test, and, and people really, have, there's not a model or prototype out yet, but it's, it's definitely going to look more along the lines of some of the work that came out of Stanford University in terms of more like performance assessment. It's, it's, I think it's going to be revolutionary, very, very different from what it was done. So in the past, we've seen a lower rate of science because the, the academic science, its teacher, its teammate, where the other assessments have been Q-star. So do we still see the next? Do we still see this new exam teacher made, or are they moving to a corporation to make that test? I think they're, no, they're not, there isn't a corporation out there making this test right now. They're really falling back on the state, the New York State science teachers, to really guide and shepherd this work, quite honestly. And right now, like I said, the plan is that this will be going away after this year, and they're going to have a new test. Anything could happen between the next two years. So science work has been heavily influenced, and quite so, the international 
implementation come. They have run very slowly on designing standards, very slowly on implementing curriculum. The assessments are really the first region's exam that's based on the next generation standards, I believe, is two years. And it's going to be teacher made, locally made, it's not going to be complete. That's, that's all the indicators. Who's setting our state can't be caught? Look at that. Well, you know, they're also looking at states that are already ahead of the game at creating these next generation national tests, Kentucky, California. So I, it's, in some ways, it's good that they can learn from their mistakes mm -hmm. um, before they rush in. But our teachers need to learn how to create these kinds of assessments because they're, they're challenging. They're way better than this is, this is a big vocabulary test. I'll be honest with you. There's a lot of vocabulary. A lot of reading besides vocabulary. I'm saying teachers should be applauded, though, for the authentic assessment they're creating. It takes a lot of time to create. Right? Imagine, you know, it's time to run a couple multiple choice tests for my kids, but not for some, but for everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're talking about real authentic uh, response to that kid's out there. So they're just getting a lot of They're doing it for every kid in the district. Um, I, I, so that's the next thing. Let's they do a lot of that because they take so much time yeah. in terms of creating those things to match what hopefully the standard is going to be. Um, but it's also a huge investment of time to make sure they get kids to kind of feedback to get them ready for the test. And, and all of, I just, I still would say that our nine program at Ellenberry School Hall is one of, like I would hold that program to any school district in, in, in this area. I mean, I think we have one of the best, like those teachers put so much effort. And that's not to just cut it and then there's science teacher in the district. That is not what I want to do whatsoever. But that was a huge overhaul and like they just continue to move forward. And so um, you know obviously that you know that takes a lot going with the fifth grade assessment now as well. I've been struggling with because they are like on the cutting edge and stuff. Yeah. And they have made some really good inroads with conventionally that are pushing the event up that's changing the way science is taught in America. They need to be taught differently, honestly. So um, just really quick, eighth grade, again, this, this also includes not just science aid, but also the living environment. Um, again, progression in a positive direction, which is certainly like that. Um, but again, this test uh, will be in May for the next few years, and then it's going to be overhauled too. So that's what we're really kind of doing. We're kind of gearing up for the new next generation standards uh, at the middle school, so that all kids will find even greater success. And of course, living environment, that test is going to change. So, any questions about eighth grade science that you might add about this year? Uh, the last slide really, really just two more slides, foreign language performance at the middle school just in three years. And you know, we certainly want to start to see it at that level one uh, language course before we go on to the level two program for high school. And we've, we've seen over the last couple of years now uh, a little better efficiency on, on assessment. And again, our foreign languages are really taking a lot of time to, to really work our kids to really understand what it is that they need to be foundationally solid over to your program on Spanish, German, or French. So, um, any questions on this? Just kind of move through. Um, this last slide was an addition. I don't think you saw this if you looked over just, your... We just got the information this week, and it's really a key data point that was tied to our whole board, the data point we wanted to include it, and it's the whole idea of credit. How many courses are kids passing in middle school? Is a direct correlation to how many credits will they accumulate in high school? I'm sorry. No, you're, you just said it. So you can kind of see our friend left. number of kids that have passed all classes as opposed to kids that maybe had, had failed like one course. Um, and the thing that Mr. Day pointed out, again, we look at the data, the, but boy, look at those numbers on the right hand side. That was a lot of their graduation percentages, right? Um, we kind of look at that, and it's like, could be. You no, know, there is a little bit of a relationship. But, um, again, the goal is to for everyone to pass, and I think, you know, Ms. Baker's already talked about the EPIC. The EPIC, whole purpose of that EPIC program is allow teachers, and that, the one thing I expect about uh, what Mr. Baker and his team is doing at the school is that, you know, I think, you know, by providing that opportunity and for the teams to have choice and, and talk, it's not that this intervention was done by another person, like they're doing it. They can flexibly use that time to really work and help support the kids. They may or may not be passing those courses. So they never get to the point of failure. And you might want to talk, because I was impressed by how you talk about, like, never wait. Like, you're not waiting for kids to have that, so. No, the only thing I have to it is that we have something called Be Proactive uh, Lunch. And what it requires to teach them is that anytime a student is, they fill an assessment um, within the next day or so, or they fill, turn something in, they fill out a sheet. It's called Be Proactive. They write it on the sheet and tell us exactly what the assignment is. And instead of that kid going to lunch and being with theirs, they have to go to be practice by lunch at that time until that assignment is complete, or whether we know if the kid can do the assignment or not. And if the kid can't do the assignment, then go back to the teacher and say, it's because they have to still set the reason why they're not doing the work. So it gives us good viewpoint of the kid knows or don't know. I just like that because it's kind of, we probably did this before, and I used to tell my kids, it's like, the consequence for not doing your work is doing your work. It's not a zero, it's not a bad grade. You gotta get to work done. That's not, and that really is kind of the thing, you know. So this work is very important, and I bought middle school for taking on because you're, Mr. Mark said last week, the kid is behind, really, when they get behind, they can't get back. And we need to build those heights 
uh, an expectation at the middle level so that when they enter high school, there we have more and more kids taking that on. And, you know, I can't fail. And at the middle level, if Frank maybe bad gets a good loop, he said, well, it doesn't matter, and I'll just keep going. We don't want that, have that mindset in place. Uh, I love the group, the proactive period, because it's a matter of, I don't know how, we're supposed to. And then we have an obligation to reteach. <coughs> have the kids we learn. But I think it sends a great message. So this, this data point, I think, is really important for us with the time to see that edge. Anyone else have any questions on anything? I just want to make one more comment, just echo uh, to build upon what Ms. Jason said, is that uh, she highlighted making their success. I just want to go back to ELA and the, and the preschool. Um, making their success in ELA, the trend is, is continuing in the mathematics, and it seems like it's statistically significant. So I just got to echo that point of you know, take a look at best practices, see what's happening, where the success is there, and some translates. Well, maybe there's factors that are invisible to me based on this data. Maybe there's demographic factors that I'm not seeing, but um, I do think there's statistically significant problems to take a look at. Anyone else? Um, in the ELA, Slide. We broke out the heritage ENL and non ENL you know, populations, but the math didn't explain. Right. I think because of the language they said, and honestly, with the math, can't be right to the language. Okay. But it can't be that. Yeah. You know, like, oh, we can be in comedy, but we are. We, translation is a big deal at, at math time. And so, translation is the playing field. You're in literacy, it's, a, it's definitely an impact. In the state, if you've been in the if you've been in the L for more than a year, you have to take the state exam, take the exam, regardless of your language. So they're getting the test read to them in their native language, but they're not necessarily being taught in their native language. Correct? Correct. So I'm going to teach you in English, or I'm going to teach you in Spanish, but test you in English, do you think you're going to say? That will make that condition. It seems kind of confusing, doesn't it? It just doesn't make much sense. I don't think we're doing this for but it does give them, it is an accommodation, it does allow them, just like adding teaching, they can use dictionaries to look up words. It is if they can read in their own language, right? We make that assumption. But it is, it is kind of a, kind of a sticky kind of thing. Catch 22. Gonna, right, but we cannot read it in English. We can only read it in Which is understandable, and I, and I get that, and I think that is, that's correct. That's the way it should be done. But if they're not learning it in their home language, if they don't understand the concept in their own language, whether it's written in English or their home language, it, does, it still doesn't make sense. It still doesn't mean they're gonna do well. And right. you see some of our results are not, they have, are not where they should be. Right? It, they have to ask me. Maybe we can talk about the answers. Okay. But also, historically, the, in math, the performance of students learning English as a new language um, was very short, if not better, than native language speakers, because the nature of students, and mainly Thai university families, we might say, here's a very different scenario. The, uh, we're going to do some of our ENL population to about 80%. It's significantly higher now. Uh, but that wasn't the case 10 to 15 years ago. So there's many other factors that are into it. Uh, and we don't get These are just modded. Because it's really kids that both may have better pass out in the early to get there. So it's going to help us kind of figure out where they are. And we are seeing that's an issue at the secondary level, at the high school level. Uh, students learning English as a new language. They are having more and more difficulties with the assessments. With 10 years, they didn't have nearly as much as now. There's other reason a lot of this language. Raise really good points. We have to figure out how to work with kids and find the best way to instruct. Right. It, it, you know, look at the slide side by side. You know, there's two sets of data for heritage on um, the English language, and then one set of data for the math. That's why I was asking. Yeah. You know, we broke it out on the ELA, but we didn't break it out on the math, even though the ELA is much more difficult and all of those things. But the numbers are very close for the most part. I mean, 10% is the biggest number difference between the ELA, non speaking, and I'm thinking, you know, what I'm saying. Got it. <laughs> I'm sorry, the words are not coming anymore. It's getting a little bit like a long time. Um, but that's why I'm getting that was my opponent, side by side, the two exams, the five points of data, or six points of data, five points of data. That's all I was going to say. I just a quick comment. Um, our staff's working really hard. I mean, we've got teachers really putting their heart out there. And I know we're seeing the same kind of presentation next year. So I wouldn't want teachers to look at this and, and be discouraged. So as I build leadership, what is the message that you're giving to them to, you know, it's tough work and, and keep going. How do you keep that kind of work? If you want to look at this and say, gosh, why are those numbers higher? How, what is the message to them? Well, there's set numbers. I mean, there's many other Correct. sets of numbers across the right. different experiences that want to be in terms of, you know, 20th century learning skills and, and things like that. So, I mean, that's, I guess that's something while we're looking at this thesis. ELA and math, you know, state, one state, you get a snapshot, you get a lot of them to do so. Um, I think the Leader in Me um, initiative has really taken root 
and that helps because we're looking at um, kids who maybe <laughs> are doing so well academically, but are you know striving to be the best leader um, and have best character that they can. And we're recognizing that um, we're putting a lot of time and effort into uh, the leader in the program, and um, like I said, it's really part of our now it's part of our verbiage. It's, it's how we um, you know, that is the framework for how we function and grow as one community as we home. So I think that um, it's a been a really laser, you know, thin focus for us, and I think that helps the teachers to see like we're really making a difference. And the one thing about Leader Me is I really feel, um, in terms of our poverty rate creating, it's building um, a resiliency in kids. And what I mentioned, the 21st century skills, public speaking, being able to know what to do, and don't want the answer, so that critical thinking, um, that's really a big part of Leader Me. Um, public speaking again, really big part of Leader Me. So I think those are the things that. Um, you know, we're kind of focusing on and, and letting the staff know they're doing an amazing job. And I also would argue, like this is a reflection of the staff, for the these numbers. I think Mr. Feldman said it best, like we we don't know the stories behind these statistics. They aren't telling us about who went from 11% on you know baseline test to 45% on a baseline test by the end of the year, but still test at level one. Like that's a huge victory and it can be celebrated just like the kid moved to a four. So like these, and if, like that's why I'm always strangely silent, and this is why I, I don't get data. Because as a teacher, I know my kids, and I will celebrate my victories with my students. I know what kind of a teacher I am. My kids know where my heart and soul are, just like all of your staff members know where their heart and soul is, and they know every day those those teachers come in that school, and their heart and soul belong with students in those seats. So whatever we put up here, because New York says we have to, and whatever game we have to play, we'll play their game. But that is no reflection of any staff member in this district whatsoever. And, and I think in different ways, every single one of you, Mr. Wolf, all of you, have said, we celebrate the victories, no matter how small they are. And once they seem to struggle, we reach out and find them, and we bring them up. We build them up. We find a way to get there. That is what we do. That is why we're all here, every single one of us. And I applaud you all, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, Mr. Ryan's story about the young man wants to New York State. I mean, that's. I'd like to shake. That, I mean, that is tremendous. You love that. <laughs> well, listen, I think Mr. Day found his next board member because I wanted to challenge New York State, and now look what happened. Here I am. Hello. So I'm here. I know. So you know what? There, you better find out that young man's thing. Just start going out. She's gonna be there, friend. All right, every train. You can find him. So I, I want to thank everybody for helping out tonight. And just my response is what I'm trying to emphasize is the experience for kids is right. They love coming to school and they love coming to school because it's fun and because the teachers know them and provide them opportunities to learn where they can learn and they back every day and everything else will take care of itself. So to that end, I think our teachers are doing a tremendous job. Um, I wish you would tell everybody how much we thank them for all they're doing uh, and that, the, you know, uh, I think they're their own harshest critics at times. And I think that they, they will continue to make it really well that they're coming in every day. And that goes all the way up to seniors. That's the goal. You know, whether or not we do it or not, is, we're, we're working on it. But that's the goal. We want people to love coming to school. And I think if, and everything else takes care of itself. So with that, I'm going to conclude tonight's superintendent's report. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hey, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the elections are set to take place in the first week of October. And that's what they did them during homecoming week. And they said it looked like there was too much going on, so they wanted to separate it. But we hope they have the board number in place and not the study session will be meeting in October. Okay, next up on our agenda is. Uh... Oh, no, no. Oh. We're going to have it. There's more to come. Yeah, no one's signing on to that. I guess the administration gets piled. We're not signing on to that. I guess the I'd like to take a consent agenda for a special education, B for financial, C the bids, D capital project, E the district safety plan, F the school resource officer contract, D the amber security professional authorization, H the amber security uh, memorandum of understanding, um, I the Fox and Company, J the initial schedule. Okay, we have a motion for a second. Second. 
All right, we have a motion and a second. We have approval items 8 through 10 for business item. Um, a is the special education class placements and preschool class placements. Any questions? Nothing new, 19 pages of the stuff. Nothing to check on. Okay. Okay. Item B is the monthly financial reports that were posted before this meeting. Any questions there? C are two separate bids, one for a trailer mounted boom and the other one for a handicapped transportation. This is the handicap. That's the one I looked you about. We got the kids moving in the session. Any questions for either of those? T is the uh, capital project votes to appoint a chairperson and the inspectors to the election. Any questions there? E is our district safety plan. Any questions about that? Item F is for the School Resource Office Chapter. Any questions there now? Item G is for the authorization for the security professionals. Any questions there? Age of the memorandum of understanding with the Amherst security professionals. Any questions there? Just keep in mind each of those last three items were changed this year based on some changes to the to. Um, I suppose we'll have obviously for you. There's some office material questions. J is the change in the middle school schedule. We need to vote on and approve. Questions there? Is there? Okay, with no questions, I'll call vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. That brings us to our informational items. Things. Uh, I attended the high school uh, open house and it, it was great. It always is. It's always very well, very well done. One thing jumped out at me though, and, and, and I don't know, I just wanted to highlight it. To me, it's important, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Wolf just mentioned it. Talked about challenging tests, not taking tests, not being challenged by tests. Talked about challenging tests. And it's, uh, to me, words matter, and, and that sets a culture. And I, I just wanted to highlight that and commend it. We were talking about EP calculus and whether or not taking you the BC and whether or not you wanted to challenge the BC test. It, it just kind of puts the onus on the student to, to accept the challenge and go for it. Whatever, it just, it, of all the things I heard that night, it really kind of struck a tone. It really just, it, it, to me, it's emblematic of, of how that conversation is in the classroom. So kudos to that. Um, I was also, I wasn't able to attend the uh, Willow Ridge PTO session conducted at the board study last week, so I don't think I've worked on that. Um, but the Student Education Foundation meeting was last night. They are off to a roaring start. Good ideas are abounding. A lot of them have decent likes about how to just really kind of supplement uh, some existing programs and some existing initiatives. Um, the fundraising is, is really, they have some great ideas that, again, have legs. They're not just great ideas that won't go anywhere. So, that group is really doing well to, to bring money in, to set themselves up to give back, help to really make an impact uh, in the district. Um, two things that maybe could have fallen into the communications, but it's more just informal. Um, I'm hearing a lot of complaints about the lack of busing for the middle school ski club. I think you've seen some, at least one. I uh, heard about. I had a multiple. I ways. figured. I only heard about one. Well, I couldn't respond. It was there's been a misperception. The middle district has prevented ski club from going. That wasn't the case. The case, the problem is that we, in the last year, there two buses, and at three, leaving at 3.30 in the afternoon is guaranteeing that buses are available. So we had a meeting today with uh, ski club advisors. We talked about if there was one bus, we could probably guarantee one bus, and, you know, as a, as a starting point, uh, if they could, you know, if there was a limit on the no kids and said it was a first come first, we'd be able to provide a bus. It's, we just don't know what, if we have two buses and then there are two buses, then what do we do with kids that pay? $50 to be a part of ski club. So we're working it through and we would be able to come up with a pretty good solution for this year. But long term, the idea that this provides transportation to the bridge that has to be when we need all of us to be got a challenging uh, for the future. Are you going to respond to uh, that? I have responded to the people I've gotten. Could you just copy me up on those? I, I will copy all of you Please. and then there'll be another one once we define the solution. Well, right now it looks like on Thursday we're going to say that we are going to have no ski club. And we'll district, district provide transportation, but we may have to limit or squeeze getting the kids in there. Because you know, usually it was like 55 kids in two buses. If we find a way to 50 kids in one bus, then we probably can come up with alternatives. Yeah, it's yeah, just as a family skiers and snowboarders, it seems like everybody's going to talk to me about how many kids <laughs> middle school kids keep up. And then just the last one, uh, similar note, this one didn't have as much information to back it up, but I had two folks just mentioned in passing again uh, about the lack of ability of uh, drivers at uh, different sessions of drivers at the So I don't know how much that. Board has influenced that, so that 
Well, the driver that is followed is very few. There's no way no companies are offering that. I'm just getting more and more. I don't think do we have anybody who applies to So, uh, you know, Mr. Feldman, what we did, we were in contract with AAA. That's what I we, we employed uh, the classroom instructor, which was fine. Uh, the kindergarten instruction was provided by AAA. AAA bid on it last year this time, the entire school district, the entire school year. Uh, they provide summertime, or I beg your pardon, uh, provide uh, summertime, fall, uh, winter session, and spring session. Uh, and they formed us at the end of uh, the spring session last year, just after they bid on it. They were the only one to bid on it, but they couldn't provide us enough staff. Uh, to do any current instruction. So really it's it's kind of on a semester by semester basis. If they can recruit enough drivers, uh, we'll run driver ed. We did send out a subsequent RFP uh, to see if the other driving schools would uh, want to take a crack at our, our program and we got no response. Okay. Uh, honestly, it's how we drivers ed. It's much like bus drivers. Uh, every day uh, for that type of instruction, it's difficult to, uh, for them to drive. AAA uh, really has two large programs, one in they also do many local school districts and they cut just about everyone for that reason. So that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. That's all I have to say. That was fun. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Don't ever make me go after Mr. Feldman. <laughs> 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 um I had conflict last week. So many thanks to Mr. Johnson for taking over my responsibility at the high school PTSA uh, board. So uh, from that, he did take detailed minutes, and it, Mr. A seemed to be there to talk about capital project, and uh, obviously Mr. Johnson was there, and I'm assuming supporting the capital project as well. Uh, Mr. Uh, Martin was there and just talked about the great opening of the school um, and emphasized the connections between students and adults. And, you know, PTSA at the high school has really had some serious growth in recent years. And what that means to all of you is that the more memberships that they get and the donuts that are sold at Open House, that all goes to scholarships. So um, they have been able to increase the number of PTSA scholarships and the amount that goes into those scholarships through dollars for scholars over recent years. And I would really probably like to thank Mrs. Lissa, who is the president. She really works hard and it is her goal to really just keep um, growing that program, and so she, I um, mean, they've all done a wonderful job. Uh, they did sell out of donuts um, again at Open House, and the basket raffle. So the crab show is crab show. That's crab show. Are they not doing a fall crab show? show. Yeah. 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 October nineteenth. October nineteenth. And they do the basket raffle at the crab show, and then they do. They're looking for books, used books for donations, and free goods and any baskets. Um, you know, if you have donations there. Uh, they are willing to take those as well. Again, all raises money toward, that goes toward scholarships. I just want to add one thing. The dollars from those PTSA scholarships, you get your member PTSA, which is like $5. So I would encourage you to join. Thank you. Um, the other meeting that I was at was for the Delegate Assembly through the Erie County Association Support Boards out at um, OC. They did make a correction to the capital conference dates. Um, at um, something, it was indicated that the dates were like in the middle of the week, but no, it will be the 9th and 10th again in February. They went through um, they went through nominations. I'm happy to report that our very own Mr. Scott Johnson was um, nominated to be the legislative team leader once again, and he got all glowing. Like people are so thrilled with his leadership. Um, so they they really um, you know I'm proud to, to sit here with you. Um, as you continue to fight for our school. Okay. Um, just, I went, attended the meeting last night with um, Mr. Morrow and uh, Judge. And there, I, I would again like to publicly, there was um, the one person that was there that was not in administration or one of us did mention to that he had heard um, from numerous people the lunch program that the kids are all eating for free lunch and breakfast. So again, kudos to Sandy Coca. Wow, what a great program. And um, there was a nice article in the Buffalo News talking about our capital project. Like that, but it really was a nice detailed spelled it out for And I think that's it. Okay. Um, I did enjoy going to the high school PTSA. It's been a little while since I've seen one of their meetings. And they did mention they've got a, they've got a, a nice membership ready. They're, they're starting out strong. Um, 
I also attended the Glendale PTA. Uh, they're in the process of updating their bylaws, just some minor changes. They had 34 members as of that point, but a bunch of them joined that night. Their first fundraiser was starting next week, and they were funding field trips like they have in the past. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, I was happy to say at both Glendale and the high school, there was more people I'd, that I'd seen attending the PTA meeting in probably several years, so that was a good thing. Um, one of the things that I, I didn't write in your notes for the high school, I did talk with them a little bit about, I think we talked about it last week, about the unified sports, and I said I want to reach out to all the PTS, PTS, PTSAs, PTO, to try and get a little bit of help once the public time <coughs> period opens up, and, and they, they agreed that they would be willing to help on that. Um, Is it, does that date been set yet? They are supposed to publish okay. it on the 25th of September, and as soon as I'm going to check that morning and look, and assuming it's out, I'm going to try and get the link out. And we had a uh, excuse me, a summit, an executive board meeting for your county association school boards that I don't remember if I talked about it last week, but we talked a lot about it. It's a lot of the same things that Joe Casio talked about. We're also in the process of updating our own bylaws and working on our policy manual there. And I'll leave it with that. That brings us to our <coughs> second open session on the agenda. Again, as per board policy 1512, we hold two open sessions at each meeting. The second session may be used to address the board on any topics appropriate for open session. All the same stuff the board we welcome you. Any comments or questions? Just real quickly, as a representative of the school district, I want to thank the board um, and all of our district administrators for supporting our exceptional classrooms in Saba. It's a sizable investment in terms of the transportation for our kids. And so I just want to thank everybody. This is a great program for our exceptional classrooms. Else? Okay. That moves us on to our personnel section of our agenda. And I look for a motion for a consent agenda there. I would like to make a consent a motion for consent agenda for one teaching and administrative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And then we are teaching and administrative substitute. Service. service and service, yes. Okay. So we have a motion. Is there a session? Second on that? Second. So we have a motion and a second for item one, teacher administrative, item two, service employees. Any discussion or any questions on any of those items? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. That brings us to the end of the meeting. I look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.